surveillance. We talked about the fifth. Uh, we talked about um, McDonald's versus Chicago, which deals with the Second Amendment. Today, we're going to start with the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment houses multiple guarantees of freedom, like the right to due process, uh, freedom from double jeopardy. But in this class, the main thing that we are concerned about is freedom from self-incrimination. The government cannot force you to testify against yourself, which a lot of you have come to know as the right to remain silent. If you have information that you don't want to reveal to the government, if you are accused, then you have the freedom not to reveal that to the government. You don't have to disclose any information if you are accused. Now they can force you to testify against somebody else, but they are not allowed to force you, they're not allowed to force you to testify against yourself. You have the right to remain silent. So the Fifth Amendment guarantees freedom from self-incrimination or the right to remain silent. When it comes to the Fifth Amendment, the most important case is Miranda versus Arizona set in 1966. However, this is not one of your required cases. You don't need to know the facts of this case. You don't need to know the name of the case. You need to know the president established by the Supreme Court in Miranda versus Arizona. In Miranda versus Arizona, a man named Ernesto Miranda, the person that you see there, raped and killed a 19-year-old girl. He gets detained and arrested by the police. And during the interrogation, he ends up confessing to the crime. The thing about Ernesto Miranda is he was an, ind an indigent, which means he was very poor and he was uneducated. He did not know anything about the Constitution. He did not know anything about his rights. He ends up confessing to the crime. His lawyer, after he found out what his client did, made an argument. He said, my client was forced to give up a right that he did not know he had, which is the right to remain silent. He did not know the Fifth Amendment existed. He did not know that he does not have to talk during a police interrogation. He should have been warned by the authorities before they started questioning him. The Supreme Court agreed, and this is what we call the Miranda ruling. The Supreme Court said, authorities have to warn you about two particular rights. Number one, the Fifth Amendment's right to remain silent. And number two, the Sixth Amendment's right to a counsel before they start questioning you. If they neglected that duty, if they do not warn you about those two rights, statements made are inadmissible in the court of law. We cannot use it against a person in the court of law. Even, like in this case, even if they confess to the crime, that confession, according to Supreme Court, will be deemed inadmissible if they were not warned about those two specific rights. You can confess to the crime, you can confess to 9-11 if you want to. If the police neglected to warn you about those two particular rights, statements that you made will be made an inadmissible. That's why today we call those two rights as your Miranda rights. You see it a lot in courtroom dramas and movies. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to a lawyer. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. They have to give you those warnings. Why? Because according to the Supreme Court, whatever statements that they make before that will be inadmissible in court. In order to make his statements um, admissible or usable in the court of law, the authorities have to warn you about those two rights. Anyone have any questions so far? This is to ensure that somebody like Ernesto Miranda, someone who does not know anything about the law or the Constitution of the United States, does not inadvertently give up a right that he did not know he had. If you're curious, Ernesto Miranda was found guilty anyway. They just couldn't use his confession as evidence against him, but they use other evidences to make him guilty or to have the jury find him guilty. Anyone have any questions about the Miranda ruling? Sir, yeah. if somebody were to confess, like okay. without hearing their the stuff, uh -huh. but could they still be found innocent? Could they still be found innocent? 
if the other well you're saying before they gave they gave him their, his rights or after he gave they gave him yes the warning before warning. if he before. confessed before yes if there's no other evidences other than the confession that would point him to the crime then he would be found not guilty all right however when it comes to the miranda ruling there is one exception that you need to remember and this symbolizes this conflict that i've always taught you about in this class, there's a conflict between our freedoms and public safety. So in the court case, New York versus Quarles, again, not one of your required cases. You don't need to know the facts of the case. You don't need to know what happened. You don't even need to remember the name of the case. You need to know the president. The president is the Supreme Court made an exception to the Miranda ruling. In New York versus Quarles, there was a man who was being who was suspected of raping a woman a police officer identified that ma man in a grocery store an empty grocery store he starts arresting the man he starts frisking the man making sure he didn't have any weapons on his person and when he was doing the frisking he finds a holster but that holster was empty the police officer immediately becomes concerned. Where's the gun? So he asks the person that he's arresting, where's the gun? The man points to where he hid the gun. He says, it's over there. And sure enough, he was telling the truth. He did hide the gun where he pointed. Now, what's the issue? If you were the lawyer for this man, what is the issue that you should probably bring up in court? He didn't read him his rights. He was not read his rights, which means that statement that he made where he said it's over there should be inadmissible in court. Not only that, since they found the gun as a direct result of his statement, they should not be able to use the gun against the suspect as well because the police neglected to warn him about his Fifth Amendment's right to, uh, to remain silent and his Sixth Amendment right to a counsel, his statement and the gun that was found because of his statement should be made inadmissible according to the Miranda ruling. That's exactly what his lawyer argued in court. The Supreme Court said, no, we're gonna make an exemption in this case. The police, asked that question because he was concerned about public safety. There was no time to read him and warn him about his Miranda rights. So the Supreme Court said, we're gonna make an exemption in this case. If the police ask a suspect a question concerning public safety, which he did in this case, then the statement that is made as a response will be admissible in court, even without the Miranda warnings. So the Supreme Court allowed for his statement and the gun that they found as a result of the statement to be admissible to be used in court because it was a response to a question regarding public safety. Anybody have any questions? This will be forever known as the public safety exemption, exception to the Miranda ruling. If the question it concerns public safety, then the statements made by the suspect will still be admissible even without the Miranda warning. Any questions about that, guys? Hopefully this is simple stuff. Let's go ahead and move on. This is one of your required cases. I need you to know the facts of this case. This is Gideon versus Wainwright. We're dealing with the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment, like the Fifth, has a lot of guarantees of freedom, like you have the right to a, to a speedy trial. You have crimes will take place with the, or the, I'm sorry, trials will take place with the crime took place. But today, our focus is the Sixth Amendment's right to a counsel, the right to a lawyer. In Gideon versus Wainwright, <clears throat> Clarence Gideon was accused of breaking and entering into a building. During his trial, which is done in a Florida court, in a state court, 
he asked the state of Florida for a lawyer. Like Ernesto Miranda in the Miranda versus Arizona case, this guy is very poor. He's also uneducated. He did not feel like he can defend himself properly in court. So he asked the state of Florida for a lawyer. Here's what's going against him. Everybody in this class should know the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to a counsel. But before Gideon versus Wainwright, Wainwright, that guarantee of freedom only applies to the federal government in federal court. If I was accused of a federal crime, then I am entitled to a right to a counsel, to a lawyer, if I wanted to, in federal court. But this is different. Gideon was tried in the state court. He was tried in a Florida court, and he's asking for a lawyer. And at this time, states were still allowed to refuse you a counsel. They were not um, liable to give you a lawyer if you cannot afford one. That only applied to federal court, to the federal government. So the state of Florida said, you don't have money. We cannot provide you with a lawyer. Gideon was forced to stand on trial and defend himself. And not knowing anything about the law, he ends up being found guilty and sentenced to five years in jail. In jail, he starts reading the Constitution and he finds the Sixth Amendment's right to a counsel. And he asks the Supreme Court of the United States, thank you, he asks the Supreme Court of the United States to look at his case again. Thank you so much. <clears throat> he said, I asked Florida for a lawyer. They did not give me one. And I feel as a result, I was found guilty because of it. That right to a lawyer should be something that even state governments, even state and local courts should recognize. Because without it, people like me are powerless in court. What are we about to talk about? Incorporation. Incorporation. What is he asking the Supreme Court to do, essentially? He's asking that this right right here, the right to a counsel, is so important, it's so fundamental, that it needs to be what? What is it? What does? What is he asking the Supreme Court, guys? Basically, to add it to the state level. To apply it and incorporate it to the state and local governments. This is something. This is a right that needs to be recognized by the state and local governments as well. We're about to talk about one of your two selective incorporation cases. What's the other one? What was the other case when we talked about something in the Bill of Rights being applied to the state and local governments? We talked about it Friday. <clears throat> Anyone remember? Guys, before your test, this should be automatic. The Second Amendment's right to bear arms was incorporated in McDonald versus Chicago. In this case, the Sixth Amendment's right to a counsel will be incorporated by the Supreme Court to the state and local governments. So the Supreme Court agreed with him. They deemed that the right to a counsel guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment is a fundamental right that needs to be applied to the state and local governments. What allows the Supreme Court of the United States to incorporate freedoms, protections of the Bill of Rights found in the Bill of Rights to the state and local governments? What allows that to happen? By now, guys, if you don't know this, you need to pay attention carefully. What allowed, in 2010, what allowed the Supreme Court to incorporate the right to bear arms to the state and local governments, in this case, in 1963, what allowed them to incorporate the right to a council to the state and local governments? What justifies that? The 14th Amendment? The 14th Amendment. What clause of the 14th Amendment justifies it? The due process? The due process clause. Very good. 
The 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause allows for selective incorporation. It allows the Supreme Court of the United States to apply a provision, a guarantee of freedom from the Bill of Rights and apply it not only to the federal government, but apply it to the state and local governments. That's what selective incorporation is about. The justification for selective incorporation is the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause that states that that states that no government, including state and local governments, can deny you of liberty. And what is the Supreme Court's criteria in determining if a right should be applicable to the states if it is fundamental? And in this case, they agreed with Gideon that the right to a counsel of the Sixth Amendment is a fundamental right. That's why they applied it to the state and local governments in this case. Thanks to this man right here, if you are ever tried in a state court, state courts have to provide you with a lawyer even if you cannot afford one. And 95% of all cases in the United States are state court cases, guys. Only 5% are in federal, in federal court. That's how important this decision is. Today, if you are facing a trial, more likely it's going to be a state trial. It's going to be in state court. Thanks to Clarence Gideon, even if you cannot afford a lawyer, you can, even if you cannot afford a defense, the government will provide you with one because he got the Supreme Court to apply the right to counsel, the right to a counsel to the state and local governments. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions about this, guys? So in your head, guys, pair up. This is how I remember things. Chunk them together. You have Engel versus Vitali and Wisconsin versus Yoder. Both of those have to do with religion. These two, Gideon and McDonald's versus Chicago, are about selective incorporation. Pair them up together. It's easier to remember that way. <clears throat> All right. Let's go ahead and move on. The next, we're, next we're going to talk about the right to privacy. The right to privacy is not as clear-cut as your other liberties, like right to bear arms or right to a counsel, because those things are specifically spelled out in the United States Constitution. If you read the Bill of Rights today, you can identify, you can find those rights specifically. The problem with the right to a counsel is it's not specifically spelled out in the Constitution. Nothing in the U.S. Constitution says that you have the right to, a, to privacy specifically. None of your amendments say that. That is the problem. However, thankfully, case after case in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has decided that we do have the right to privacy, even if it's not specifically mentioned in the Constitution of the United States. Multiple amendments in the Bill of Rights implies that we have the right to privacy. So I'll give you some examples. The Third Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says, government cannot force you to house a soldier. Government cannot force you to take in a stranger into your house. That implies privacy. The Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable searches and seizure. That definitely implies privacy. The Fifth Amendment, you have the right to remain silent. If you have information that you don't want to divulge to the government, you don't have to. That implies privacy. The Ninth Amendment, you have unlisted personal freedoms that are still protected, including the right to privacy. So all those amendments in the Bill of Rights implies, according to the Supreme Court, that people should have a reasonable expectation that some parts of their lives should be kept private. However, the most important constitutional justification for privacy is not found in the Bill of Rights. It's actually found outside of the Bill of Rights. It's found in the most important amendment in this class, not only good for selective incorporation, but also to protect the right to privacy for American citizens like you and me. The 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause has been used by the Supreme Court to rule that the right to privacy is protected in the United States. What about the due process clause that um, gives us an impression that we have the right to privacy? Well, read it with me. 14th Amendment, nor shall any government, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, and property. 
the Supreme Court has interpreted that word liberty, that you are guaranteed liberty to include the right to privacy. And more often than not, when the Supreme Court receives a privacy case, they use that, the 14th Amendment's due process clause, and what we will call from now on as the due process clause liberty guarantee to rule that the right to privacy in the United States is protected, that we do have the right to privacy. So all of these amendments right here from the Bill of Rights, and most especially the 14th Amendment's due process clause and its liberty guarantee implies that we have the right to privacy in the United States. And what I need you to remember most importantly is this one. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment and its liberty guarantee has been used by the courts over and over again to rule that people like you and me have the right to privacy against the government. To <clears throat> let you know how important this is, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment has been used by the Supreme Court in cases in the past to extend privacy to things like homeschooling your own children. That's not something that government should be able to mess with. If I want to teach and educate my own kids, I should be able to do so according to the Supreme Court because that is protected by the right to privacy and the right to privacy is protected by the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Something that a lot of you gentlemen might know about, your ability to watch porn is protected by the right to privacy according to the Supreme Court. The 14th Amendment's due process clause and its liberty guarantee extends to your right to consume pornography, according to the Supreme Court. That's why government cannot stop you from doing that. You know what, that was sexist. Women watch porn too. But again, the right to privacy extends to watching porn. That's protected by the Constitution. The government cannot say, oh, you're not allowed to watch this. That's something that should be private. You should know, guys, before the Supreme Court made a decision in a lot of the states, using contraceptions like women taking birth control pills and men using condoms was illegal by state law until the Supreme Court in Griswold versus Connecticut decided, you know what, that's private. Whatever a man and a woman do with their own, in their own bedroom should not be the concern of the government. So they used the 14th Amendment's due process clause to extend the right to privacy to contraceptions. That's why today you are free without government intervention to use protection, which I would recommend. All right, next. Why are we talking about the right to privacy? Why are we talking about this? Because it's going to be important in one of your other required cases in this class, Roe versus Wade. I've alluded to this case over the times that you spent in this class. This is the abortion case one of the most controversial cases in American history. It's still very controversial today, especially in a lot of our conservative section of the, uh, of the United States. This is the case that would legalize abortion in the United States. So to tell you the impact of Roe versus Wade, I should probably talk about what was America like before Roe versus Wade. Before Roe versus Wade, in almost all the states in the United States, by state law, it was illegal for a woman to terminate her own pregnancy early. She could not control that. The government does. By state law, the government forbid women from having abortions in most of the states in the United States, including especially our state, which is a very conservative, very religious state, especially in the 1960s. Well, a woman by the name of Jane Roe, that's not her real name, her real name is Norm, Norma McCurvey, but we're not, we don't use her real name because they wanted to protect her identity because this is such a hot button issue that her life might be in danger because of it. A woman named Jane Roe challenged the uh, Texas law that banned abortion in our state. She said that law is unconstitutional. If a woman in Texas wants to have an abortion, she should be able to do so without government telling her she could not. If you are on the side of abortion, I don't care if you really are for abortion or not, but let's pretend that you are. How do you argue your case? What would be a good justification 
for saying all those laws that forbid abortion, all those state laws should be deemed unconstitutional. Very good, Sabrina. This is about a woman being able to control her own body. A woman's body should be something that is private, that should be outside of the control of the government. So the argument on the abortion side is they're calling for the right to privacy that has been used to protect watching porn, using con contraceptions, homeschooling your own kids. They said that protection should extend to abortion, the right of a woman to choose whether or not she should continue with her pregnancy. So they're arguing for the right to privacy should extend to abortion. Anyone have any questions so far? On the other side, you have state governments like Texas, whose policy is being challenged in this case, that said, we have an interest to protect the life of the unborn. We have an interest to protect the life of a woman. If abortion would put her life in danger, we should be able to stop a woman from committing an abortion to protect the life of the unborn and to protect the woman's life. Those are the two things in conflict in this case. So what did the Supreme Court decide? The Supreme Court decided, again, the question is, does the right to privacy extend to abortion? Because if it does, then state governments cannot restrict it, cannot limit abortion. All those state laws that did would be unconstitutional. Well, the Supreme Court said, yes, the right to privacy does extend to abortion. A woman's right to choose to terminate her pregnancy is protected by the right to privacy. And what is used as a justification to say that we do have the right to privacy? What's that one clause in the Constitution that's used by the Supreme Court to protect privacy rights in the United States? Guys, in each one of these required cases, you need to know the clauses that are involved. And in Roe versus Wade, what is the clause that is involved? What has been used by the Supreme Court over the years to protect the right to privacy? The 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause. Thank you, thank you, Lorenzo. Let's be more specific than that. The 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, and it's what? Liberty. The Liberty Guarantee. Very good. So the 14th Amendment, specifically the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, but specifically the Liberty Guarantee of the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause that says the right to privacy is protected in the United States, but that right to privacy also extends to abortion according to the Supreme Court. However, guys, here's what you need to remember. The Supreme Court did not rule for absolute protection of privacy. They allowed room for state governments to still put some restrictions on abortion. Here's how the Supreme Court case went down. They said, a woman's pregnancy typically takes place in nine months. Those nine months medically are divided into three trimesters. The first three months of a pregnancy is called the first trimester. The middle three months is the second trimester. And the last three months of a pregnancy is called the third trimester. The Supreme Court said the right to privacy protects abortion absolutely in the first three months of a pregnancy. No state restrictions, no state limitations against a woman's right to choose whether or not she would continue with her pregnancy or abort her pregnancy. However, after that first trimester, that absolute protection doesn't last. In the middle three months, what we would call the second trimester, states are allowed to put some limitations, some restrictions on abortion. They can make it harder for a woman to have an abortion, especially if it concerns the life of the woman. So states can put some rules and, and, and legislation in the second trimester of a pregnancy to protect their interests, to preserve the woman's life, or to preserve the life of the unborn some restrictions. They can't outright ban it in the second trimester, but they can make it harder in the second trimester. How, how would they do that? 
if you're a minor, they can make it a requirement that your parents consent in the second trimester. Or they can make it a requirement that your, the father consents to the abortion. They can make it a requirement that before you have your abortion in the second trimester, you need to go to counseling. And that counseling would discourage you probably from having the abortion in the first place. In the last three months, what we call the third trimester, the Supreme Court said states can outright ban it. These are called late-term abortions. And very late into the pregnancy, the Supreme Court have allowed state governments to just say, you know what, by state law, we're going to ban late-term abortions. So in the United States, because of federalism, it's different per state. In some states, it's very easy to have an abortion in the second trimester, and they're still allowed to have a, an abortion in the third trimester. In some states, like ours, late-term abortion during the third trimester is illegal. But this is certainly better for women than it used to be before Roe versus Wade. Because abortion in the first three months of a pregnancy is completely and absolutely protected. The right to privacy, according to the Supreme Court, extends to abortion, especially during those first three months. So if you want to have an abortion, it doesn't matter how religious your state is, like the state of Texas, they cannot limit you from doing so, especially on the first trimester. Anyone have any questions so far? So make sure you know what states could do and what they cannot do in the first, the second, and the third trimester. They can outright ban it in the last trimester. They can't do anything to it in the first trimester. A little bit in between in the second trimester. <clears throat> so what is the impact of this case? This legalized abortion in the United States. All those laws that ban abortion outright were made unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said that Texas law and all the laws in across the United States that ban abortion are unconstitutional. They're a violation of our right to privacy under the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause and its liberty guarantee. Anyone have any questions? But remember, guys, they didn't completely side with women's rights in this case. They left some room for state restrictions and state limitations. There's a balance. But for the most part, this is a huge victory for women and women's rights in the United States. Whether or not you agree with it or not, morally or legally, this was a huge victory for women. <clears throat> All right. Now, this is how does the decision of Roe versus the Wade came out. There were nine justices in the Supreme Court. There's always nine justices in modern time. The justices that are bolded are the ones who are responsible for the decision. So this was a seven to two decision. Two of the justices, Justice Rehnquist and Justice White, disagreed. Does anybody know how many of the justices have to agree in order for the Supreme Court to have a decision? How many of them have to agree in order for the Supreme Court to make a decision? Five. Five, very good, a simple majority. So it only requires five to agree in order to, for the Supreme Court to make a decision. But in this case, they got a huge majority, seven out of two agreed with legalizing abortion in the United States. Now, typically, one of these justices is gonna be responsible for writing what we call a majority opinion. Those of you that are gonna go into law and law enforcement, you guys are gonna be reading a lot of these majority opinions. So what is a majority opinion about? It's like an essay written one of, by one of these justices that outlines the reasons why the court decided the way that they did. So typically the Supreme Court is not, just not gonna make a decision and then leave it at that because they know their decisions are going to be studied. In the future, their decision is going to be used by future courts. So it's essential for them to give out their reasons why they're deciding the way they are. And they give justifications. What are things that can be used to justify a court's decision, guys? What's the number one thing that you should be using in your argument, in your essay, in explaining why you decided the way that you did as the Supreme Court? The Constitution. The US Constitution, that's number one. 
We need to use the U.S. Constitution. What other, what other things that we talked about in class can be used by these judges to justify their opinion? Federalist papers. The Federalist papers. Those Federalist papers, our founding fathers like Hamilton and Madison, explained themselves very thoroughly about what they meant with the Constitution. So you can use the Federalist papers as justification. Leander is correct. Very good. Presidents of the past. Because the Supreme Court in the past decided the way that they did, we're using that president to decide the same way. So presidents can also be used. So Federalist papers, presidents in the past made by the Supreme Court, decisions of the past, and most importantly, the Constitution of the United States. So one of these justices is responsible for writing that majority decision, writing that essay, and in the future, law students, future judges and justices of, of the Supreme Court are going to be studying these uh, these opinions. However, guys, not only that, one of the losing justices, the people who did not agree with the majority of their fellow justices, they have the option to write their own opinion called the dissenting opinion. What does it mean to dissent? If I'm dissenting, that means I'm disagreeing. To dissent means to disagree. So one of these justices, or both of them if they want to, can write their own essay. And what would that essay talk about? Their reasons why they disagreed with their fellow justices. Using the Constitution, fellow's papers, president, they can outline why, they didn't, well, why were they not part of the majority's decision. And, and like majority opinions, these dissenting opinions are also dissected and studied by law students and by judges in the future. Anyone have any questions so far? In most of the required cases in AP government, you don't need to know the dissenting opinion. All you need to know is the majority opinion, which is what I talk about when I say, oh, what did the Supreme Court use? What justification did they use to make such a decision? That's the majority opinion. We've talked about that in Roe versus Wade. We talked about that already. The 14th Amendment, due process clause and its liberty to guarantee was used to extend right to privacy to abortion. That's their, that's their opinion. Roe versus Wade is unique for a class because not only do you need to know why the Supreme Court decided the way that they did, why did they held, why did they rule the way that they did, you also need to know why these two justices particularly disagreed with their fellow judges. You need to know what their dissenting opinion was about. Anyone have any questions? So let's talk about their dissent. Justice White, he believed that his fellow judges had an agenda. And that agenda was to legalize abortion in the United States. Before they heard the case, they had an agenda that they want to accomplish. And his fellow justices used their power, in this case, their judicial review power, to meet that agenda, to accomplish that agenda. They, he accused them of having an agenda and using their power as judges and justices of the Supreme Court to um, achieve what they wanted to achieve, which is not what the Supreme Court is supposed to do, according to White. They're supposed to be there to be referees, to settle questions about the Constitution. But he said, in our case, this is not what my fellow justices did. They had an end goal in mind, and they used their power as justices of the Supreme Court to achieve that goal. They were exercising raw judicial power. And as a result, laws passed by state legislatures across the United States, those anti-abortion laws passed by state legislatures, including Texas, were deemed unconstitutional, which to him was unfair because these laws were passed by people who were democratically elected by their state. And justices like him are appointed, they're not elected. And what the Supreme Court was doing is it's overturning the will of the American people. We should let the state governments decide what to do with abortion. What gives the Supreme Court the right to just overturn all these laws across the states? Why not allow the state governments, like we've been doing before Roe versus Wade, to decide whether or not they're gonna allow abortion in their state or not? Why invalidate and strike down all of those laws passed by these state legislatures who, unlike us, are democratically elected. 
essentially what Justice White is accusing his fellow justices of being is he's accusing them of exercising what? Uh, judicial activism. Judicial activism. You all had an agenda and you all use your power to achieve that agenda. You're using judicial power, judicial review wrong. All right, Rehnquist had a different opinion. Rehnquist said, he argued, that the 14th Amendment's due process clause, which was used to justify the court's decision in this case, was added to the Constitution a long time ago. This was in the 1960s, Roe versus Wade. The 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution in the 1860s, after the Civil War. How come? No Supreme Court until ours have used the 14th Amendment's due process clause to legalize abortion in the United States and strike down all those abortion laws. How come we're the first ones? How come it took 100 years since the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution of the United States, and then 100 years later, we use it to legalize abortion in the United States? How come it took that long? And for Rehnquist, there's only one answer. The answer is the 14th Amendment was never meant to be used to protect abortion in the United States against state limitations. It was not meant for that. If it was meant for that, then Supreme Courts earlier than ours would have used it to legalize abortion a long time ago. Yet they didn't. It took 100 years until our court did it. So he's, at, he's arguing that presidents' decisions or the lack of a decision by courts of the past can only mean one thing. The 14th Amendment's due process clause and its liberty guarantee was never meant to protect abortion. We are interpreting the Constitution wrong against president. So what is, what is he pretending or what is he claiming to exercise here? That he's following president. He's not making new president. So he's a what? Someone that believes in what? Uh, judicial restraint. Judicial restraint. Why not follow the president of the past where the Supreme Court stayed quiet when it comes to abortion? The Supreme Court didn't strike down all these anti-abortion laws in the, in the states. We should follow our predecessors and not make a decision in this case and let the state governments decide their own policy regarding abortion. Anyone have any questions so far? I know this is a very controversial issue, but those are the arguments against Roe versus Wade. Now, abortion issues in the United States are continuing right now. Um, after Roe versus Wade, guys, after the Supreme Court legalized abortion in Roe versus Wade, the years after that, the Supreme Court had allowed more and more restrictions on abortion. They've allowed the states to make it harder and harder for their women to have an abortion. Like, for example, in Texas, before you can have an abortion, I think in the second trimester, you need to look at your baby's ultrasound. Abortion is a hard enough decision but like manipulating a woman's decision by showing her um, the ultrasound is going to make it tougher for the woman to have the abortion. But this is a requirement in the state of Texas. And according to Supreme Court, this restriction is perfectly constitutional. So more and more restrictions were imposed on abortion. Here's a question. Did the Supreme Court change its mind? How come the Supreme Court, after Roe versus Wade, had allowed more restrictions on abortion? Did the Supreme Court, did the judges of the Supreme Court change their minds regarding abortion? What did I tell you happens to the Supreme Court? They get changed. They get changed. Those nine justices that ruled in Roe versus Wade, are they the same just justices as we have now? No, they're not. So what happened after Roe versus Wade is Republican conservative presidents were getting elected, like Ronald Reagan, the two Bushes, President Trump. And as a result, our Supreme Court has transformed. In Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court was largely very liberal. 
But since more conservative presidents became president and they were able to appoint new justices into the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has transformed to be more conservative. I told you the dominant ideology of the Supreme Court is constantly shifting. Sometimes they're more liberal, sometimes they're more conservative because they're dying off or they're retiring. So since the Supreme Court became more conservative, they made decisions that have allowed states to impose more restrictions on abortion. And right now, we have a very, very conservative Supreme Court. I think it's like six to three. And this president right here that we just talked about, Roe versus Wade, like I told you, it's in danger. Those conservative justices can overturn this decision. And they can allow the states to ban abortion again if they wanted to. And break president from Roe versus Wade. That's why it's important who your president is going to be. That's why it's important who they're going to be appointing. Does this make sense for everybody? Anyone confused by this? All right, so a couple of things. Oops, I forgot to do a check. All right, if you're present today, um, you are exempted from the lesson assignments. Um, so if you look over here, you are exempted from lesson four assignments, lesson four part one and lesson four part two. You can do it anyway for bonus points. But tonight, what I need you to concentrate on is your SCOTUS number one. Your SCOTUS number one is due tonight. Actually guys, if you wanna work on it, some of you are like owls, wanna work on it in the middle of the night, that's fine. I'm not gonna grade it until morning, okay? So morning, I want your submissions done. It's important to submit, guys, because this is a test grade. If you're late, I count off 10 points off. That's 10 points off a test grade. And I'm, I'm going to allow you to correct these, but I'm only going to allow you to submit three times. If you don't submit tonight and tomorrow I'm grading and you don't have a submission, then you miss out on one of your chances to improve your grade to 100. So it's important that you turn it in and try to turn it in before tomorrow morning so that you don't miss out on your chances and you don't get points deducted. Even if you don't do too well your first submission, that's fine. You still have chances, but don't waste the chances. Does that make sense for everybody? All right. Tomorrow, um, you're going to be in charge of lesson, I think, lesson five. is going to be due tomorrow, part one and part two. You just watch Ed Puzzles like we used to do. And I think SCOTUS number two will be due Wednesday. I'm not going to give you any homework Wednesday. We're just going to talk about some stuff. And um, SCOTUS number two will be due Wednesday. If you don't have any other questions, guys, you guys have a good day. Thank you guys for coming today. Um, we'll see you all Wednesday. You don't have the, the senior talks anymore. That's going to be – that was rescheduled for the 26th, like arbitrarily, but – 26, that's when your senior talk is going to be, so don't worry about that for right now. Have a good day, guys. We'll see you all next time. Wait, sorry. Uh, a question actually did pop up. Have a good day, sir. Go ahead, Luis. So uh, was the 14th <clears throat> Amendment ever used against, like, uh, well, I guess, women's rights? Because it says also no. life. Oh. So, like, at what well, point? Oh, oh, that's a good question, Luis, because we're going to talk about that. Okay. Um they're going to use the 14th Amendment, not life per, that life guarantee, but they're going to use a 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Anti-abortion groups right now are using it to argue against abortion. They're saying that laws in the United States not only should protect women, but it is also should protect the life of the unborn. They should also be equally protected. So the 14th Amendment is central to the anti-abortion legal argument in the United States today. Okay. Yeah, how's it? Because when the only two justices that went against it, and then uh -huh. brought that up, so I was like, "Huh." Mm. I, I thought this was something. They might have, but I am not sure. But these are the things that you need to know for your AP exam. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, that was it. Thanks, sir. Have a good day. See ya. I just wanted to listen to Luis's question. Oh, no worries. No worries. <laughs> okay. Bye. Have a good day.